Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your questions, your hot takes, observations, ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. This week with a guest, it is tennis broadcaster Abigail Johnson. I think the world of her work, she used to be on YouTube, now she's not. I see it as my personal responsibility to bring her back onto these platforms so everybody can hear the great things that she has to say. Uh, we get into, obviously, your comments, but also some topics that I wanted to hit on off the top. Uh, it is a great conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. As for this whole mailbag with a guest thing, it's just kind of a timing thing. I know I had one last week uh, with Jonathan Stokey, which was a coach's mailbag, which, by the way, thank you for all the feedback on that. It's some of the most positive feedback I have ever gotten on a show, so I'll be sure to do Similar things in the future. Uh, but no, the mailbag is not always going to be with a guest from now on. I will be back doing this solo um, most of the time in all likelihood. But again, the the guest stuff is also really fun. Good change of pace. I've been enjoying it. Before we get into it, I must ask you, have you subscribed to my new newsletter, The Draw? It is where I curate all of the best tennis content on the internet Every single week, you can go to the draw.tennis to sign up. This week, we had a great article about the first Tibetan ATP player of all time, which is remarkable because you can't play tennis in Tibet. It was a piece in The Athletic. Uh, stuff on the new Roger Federer doc coming to Amazon. Uh, Jensen Brooksby News, John Wertheim's mailbag, Andrea Petkovic with uh, an incredible piece of writing on her substack. All of that stuff and much more on the draw. Again, go to the draw.tennis to subscribe to the newsletter. Without further ado, here's Abigail Johnson. We're joined once again by tennis broadcaster Abigail Johnson, who uh, has been on T2 with me all week, which has been awesome. First time in LA, second time on the podcast. I, I needed to make this happen again. I actually messaged you earlier this year and I was like, we got to do the show again. And you're like, hey, I'm going to be in LA this week. And this was amazing. So I want to start with this. Thanks for coming on again. Let's get your take on Los Angeles. First time here. Very big place. Impossible to really get the full idea of what it is when you're here for a week. But what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Awesome to be here. Um, and awesome to be here in two ways because I love LA. Uh, this is the second time I've been in the States full stop. I came for the first time for the US Open last year in New York. New York's my favorite city. I, don't, I wouldn't have thought a year ago that I'd be sitting here saying this to you. I, I didn't really know what to expect from the States, but I am loving exploring it. Um, LA, I kind of tried to come in with low expectations because there's this movie scene idea of it. And I feel like it's some people's picture of heaven on earth like idealist kind of place um but from the from the first day i landed i took i came here for a day early to to get over the jet lag and i walked down to santa monica beach <laughs> and i thought this is unreal every dream beach i've ever seen a picture of was probably based on this one um i mean it, it's been work uh because we we've, we've been on t2 i've had to try and live up to your standard skills. So I've been doing the homework and listening to you in the morning before I go on air. Um, but I, we've had, with the time zones of the tennis this week, we've kind of had morning to early afternoon shifts. So I've tried to be a little bit of a tourist as well. Hollywood sign, Vine Street, I did yesterday. So mm -hmm. I, I've ticked off a few things. I think given that I've only been here just under a week, I, I'm pretty happy with what I've managed to take in in that time frame and would love to come back, particularly for Tennis Channel. I, I've had a, a really enjoyable time and T2 offers something really different, which I've enjoyed. New York over LA, you know, I, I agree. I know you didn't go there. I know that's not what you said. And, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll take ownership of that take. I, I agree, but, uh, life has, has brought me out here. Also, I, I love it here. And you're right. The beach, the beach is the beach. Can't beat it. Um, this week, ATP 250s and, uh, the WTA 1000, but in, as far as the, the 250s are concerned and just February in general, it's hard for tennis to be super memorable this time of year. Like at the end of the season, when we're looking back, it's hard for February stuff to stand out. 
just by nature of the ebbs and flows of the schedule. But this week has had something pretty special with these young guys and these moments that I do think I'm going to remember. Jakob Mensik in Doha, I think I'm going to remember. Fonseca in Rio, I know I'm going to remember, like forever. Uh, Mickelson beat Demonor. That, that was it, This stuff was all happening kind of in the same day. And to me, that's what this week has been about. So we got to talk about this new generation that's kind of coming into focus, 18 through 20 years old. We're starting to see who the guys are um, on the ATP side. I guess what I want to ask you first is, do you have one that you are particularly blown away by that like you're most excited about among, should I throw out the names right now? I mentioned three. Let, let's put in Jerry Shang. Let's put in Dino yeah. Prismich. And I think his I'm good there. On my, his stream <laughs> is on my laptop right now. Um, all of them, all of them are exciting. All of them have a long-term sustainable top 100 and beyond potential. The guy that I've been tracking for multiple months is Jakob Mensik. So you can only imagine how smug I am feeling right now. Um, he, in terms of the depth of his game, his performance in big points, how young he still is, um, I I was kind of aware of him. I, I became particularly aware of him uh, during the US Open last year. He was actually, he was playing one of my friends in qualifying. So I went out to watch that match and it was a really high level match. And my friend was doing the right things. He was hitting winners to save break points. He was right in there with a, a good level, won a set. And then deep in the third set, Mensik and he he's what he was 17 at the time I think he had his 18th birthday during the tournament because he qualified and then he, he lost to Fritz actually on his 18th birthday and that was kind of one-sided but he'd more than proven his kind of sustainable base level before that I mean this is a guy who's young lacking in experience serving out of a tree on break points aces big hits at the baseline consistent defense out of the corners both wings will throw in a drop shot in there as well just to mix it up in big points as well but you got to the back end of that match and it was very very tough to actually see a way to trouble him apart from jump on the return and take it super early and risk everything and that from there he was definitely on the radar just because of how he also managed to back up that win get into main draw and start to build uh funny story and i could start to i could start to detour here um but you'll you'll have seen this gil because okay. my friend maya lumsden was playing doubles at the australian open it's the first time in melbourne so i was showing her around a bit on the final day of qualifying i made her come out to the qualifying course and uh, i took her to see mensik grognier in the final round of qualifying and she's a bit annoyed with me she's like of all the matches, why are we sat here watching this? This is such a random match. And I said to her, you, you will not be calling this a random match when this guy is top 50 minimum end of season. By the time we made second round of main draw and was pushing Hubert Hercatch, I was wishing I had said top 30. The, the reason I didn't go higher than that is because as you progress up, at the moment, he can still adopt that underdog mentality somewhat because he's playing up in terms of ranking, in terms of experience. He will hit a point where he's very much on the dartboard centrally for a lot of players, particularly his peers. And he's got to handle the changing landscape, more being on the line, the margins getting a bit, a bit tougher to cross the higher up the rankings you get. And you can never tell exactly how a player is going to handle that. You can only read from what's in front of you and what he has done this week in Qatar at the moment he's still going against Monfils he's up a set I think down in the second you can yeah. tell me more on that yeah he's down 5-1 in the second so that, that's going there free you go. there you go I've just hyped Jakob Mensik to the skies and he is down 5-1 in the second set but I mean hadn't beaten what a top 30 player coming into this event Alejandro no, had, hadn't, beaten a, first round. hadn't beaten a top 50 player top 50 there you go Davidovich Rakina, Andy Murray, long, long match, turns it around next day, beats Andre Rublev, top seed. And he beat him. Rublev did not beat himself. 
Mensik was relentless out of the corners and his eye for when to switch the rally and take things, take balls up the line, take things onto his own racket was impressive. And they are what you go up in terms of long-term potential, not winners, not highlights, mm -hmm. that sustainability. And he's sustainable. And also, yeah, very physically, I he's, don't have to say he's six he, four. Yeah, he is. He's got a lot of muscle and and weight on him, but he moves, and and that's why I almost think he's been incorrectly typecasted a little bit. As I don't know, you see, big kid eighteen hits the ball really big, no doubt about it. But I think you look at his body type, and some people have been tempted to be like, "Wow, this guy just crushes it." But wait a second, he can go sideline to sideline in a 20 shot rally. And as you said, hit really well out of the corners, slide on hard court off of both feet, which is becoming normal, but it's really, really impressive. And it, it's very center like and, and Djokovic like in his ability to do that. So what I was so impressed with, it's such a long list. And by the way, Mensik was gonna be the person who who I wanted to talk about as well. Cause I- Oh, nice. I've been over the moon on on just, he is the one, all of them have something. Every name I just mentioned have something where I go, oh my God, that's a really special element. I think Mensik is the, is the player who, when I go down the list, it's, whoa, you just checked a crazy amount of boxes. Like his serve is way better than an 18-year-old an has, has any right to hit their serve. That's a shot yes. that usually takes a while. And We've how many how many players have we seen coming up who are at that age are okay a lot of stuff is right but the serve is not developed yet physically he played three hours twenty six minutes against Murray had to play the next day against Rublev it was no problem he's eighteen that's where an eighteen year old it's normally like okay well the body it's not there yet so maybe down the road you'll be able to handle that situation better he does it right away and then you have forehand check backhand check movement check you see what i'm getting at it, that's Completely. what mensik has yeah 100 percent. and even i mean another name you mentioned there dino prismich he's he's very physically developed for his age yes. and you saw that the way he was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with djokovic at the australian open i think alcaraz coming through the way he has and being so physically developed himself that's kind of set the mold for these younger guys coming through what is required of you physically and mentally to come through. The one thing I'll say on Mensik, because you've got to look at things that he has to keep developing moving forwards. Mm -hmm. First serve, huge weapon. First serve percentage needs to be consistently higher. I, I think that's throughout his matches. That's not consistently where it could be in terms of those serves he's landing. At the moment, he's landing them in the big moments and the moments where he needs them. I think... I think he's got to be careful with that moving forwards because the the more higher ranked players he goes up against, the more with the level of returning, they'll be able to take advantage of that and just apply more scoreboard pressure, more pressure in general. Um, but the the openings are, are so few. And that's, I think, why we've both been drawn to him, that the level of completeness. That's why I did a double take when Carlos Alcaraz was coming through. I mean, I'm sure you're similar. I saw Zverev coming through. I saw Team. Mm -hmm. I saw Tsitsipas. All these guys, none of them had the level of completeness that Alcaraz had, which was stunning for his age. And I, I look, I'm not going to compare Mensik, but I, I would say that's what really made him jump, the lack of a real opening. Yeah, like you look at a guy like Prismich. I, I love Dino Prismich. And the after the Djokovic match, I think I talked for 18 minutes about how how much i loved what he did and what he offers and how it's a little bit different from the things we've been seeing but there's a real question Th there's questions about is there enough offensive artillery where he's not going to be capped at a certain point and other players have have other questions that aren't like that but mensik um it's hard for me to even bring those questions because to me he's answered so many here and by the way rublev like never gets upset and i don't know if that especially on hard court it, it had upset been upset is in stunned in terms of the result not upset is in oh kind yes of losing it a yeah little bit well, and, uh, well yeah, more, yeah. On, more on that later yeah that's yeah, the sure. last thing i just want to say uh, beating rublev and then i, I we got to mention fonseca before we finish this conversation of but, course um beating rublev to me 
is a is a pretty big deal in terms of this is a guy who really doesn't take losses that look like this very often. 10 and 0 this year against players outside the top 20. He's just been very consistent in setting a high bar, match in and match out, and Mensik was able to clear that bar. But let's talk about Fonseca, who to me, he's one of those guys who has been so spectacular in the ball striking area singularly. I haven't really seen him have to do all that much else. But what I do know, I'm going to go to Sinner again. It's reminded me a lot of Yannick Sinner because of the ease at which the power comes to Joao Fonseca. The ball is exploding off his racket, and it doesn't look like he needs to swing out of his shoes. It looks like he's completely within himself. Sometimes it's just his average rally ball, and it's that looked like a normal rally ball, but it was, what, 78 miles per hour? So the pure ball striking for Fonseca has blown me away this week. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be on the call for his win over Arta Feast. And I already had question marks about that for Feast because it was a very different outlook for him being 19. He was playing a, a younger player at this level for the first time. I don't think conditions were in Feast's favor that day. It was very heavy, very wet. And obviously Fonseca had the home crowd, but that can get on top of you. For some players, that weight, of home expectation can be crushing. It kind of pushes you two ways. Um, his focus, his clarity, his composure throughout that match, even after we finished rolling through the first set and it became more of a sticky affair in the seconds, it, it was no flash in the pan. And this, and you knew this if you'd seen him previously. I mean, I called a few of his junior matches when he was world number one last year, and and you could tell. He was special in terms of strategic awareness and that easy strike of the ball. And so, yeah, I, I didn't watch his follow-up win, but just the manner in which he beat Feast, you could see that coming because he was so ready. He was so locked in for that. And he's, what, 17? He's ranked outside the top 600. He's had minimal experience at this level. That was his second ATP main draw, the mm -hmm. first of them being this time last year. Yeah, he again just really impressive in terms of. Do you know what? Do you know what the common theme is with all these guys? Is actually how well they move corner to corner laterally at the baseline. That that's such a key foundational element of the game now. And for me, Fonseca against Feast, what really got him stuck into that encounter and was a consistency throughout the match was his sheer length of shot. He was maintaining, he wasn't just crossing the service box. That ball was routinely up at the baseline mm -hmm. and Feast didn't have a lot of opportunity to do his own thing, to switch things up, to get attacking with the forehand, just because it was that maintained level of depth from Fonseca. And yeah, I, I, I really felt like we can go get a little bit carried away when a younger player is doing something special or has one good result. And I'm very careful of that, but just the elements of what he did well to get that particular win, it, it felt, I think I called it an arrival on the mic. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was daring. And I was careful to say that it's a long journey from here, but that did feel like him arriving on the tour. Did you see what he said after the match about um, not, not on court, but, after in the press conference, I think somebody okay. called him a star in the press conference. And he was immediately like, I'm not a star. Like tennis is a week to week thing and careers are built over very, very long periods of time. So when you just said that, it sounded very close to what he was trying to drive home. And okay. it, it, it all it all goes to the same you know, the, the same point where it does seem like Fonseca is a guy who has a really good head on his shoulders, willing to use the energy of the crowd and play with a lot of enthusiasm and joy, uh, but also doesn't seem carried away by by any of this. Um, Are we so going to been fun talk to watch. about college or not? Yeah, I, I mean, what do you think? I... I've been because told he's committed to play, right? Yes. He he signed yes. with the University of Virginia, which is probably the best program in the country. I've been told his parents have always really, really wanted him to go to college. But the more success you have, as we saw saw with Ben Shelton, who he he absolutely loved college. He was playing for his dad. He was 
playing where he grew up in in Gainesville. Like I, I genuinely think Ben Shelton loved it with all his heart. But when you beat Casper Ruud, you have to think about what you're doing in college. And I, I think that kind of thing is probably going to happen with Fonseca. What do you think? I have two thoughts on this in kind of two different directions because um, I know another name you mentioned at the beginning of that list of younger players is Alex Mickelson. Mm -hmm. He was going to go to college even last year. And the aspect of that, people people kind of lose sight of the human element of, of these players. They are human beings with families and parents who want what's best for their future. And they've got to think about their emotional development as well as physical and all of this kind of stuff. Um, Alex Mickelson's parents wanted him to go to college. They'd both gone to college. He wanted to go and follow in their footsteps. Um, they initially were not down with the idea of him turning pro, but results kind of had the final say because he had that great run before he was supposed to go. And now they now they got fully on board with it. So, so the opinion there might change. But I also am thinking, uh, just the year before last, one of our good British juniors decided to go out and play college and I think he a year late as well so it was a bit of a surprise and I was surprised because you know he'd had good junior results the level was good the the versatility was there and I I genuinely believed in him as a player and he just won a 25k as well ITF event and I thought why is he going to college and I I saw him at the NTC uh, a few weeks before he went out and he said that he'd been so relieved by making the decision to go to college and having that locked in and knowing where he was headed, that he felt no pressure during that tournament where he won. And for some of these players, you know, they're young. It, it takes a lot. Very, very few players can sustain a top 100 ranking, a top 150 ranking long term. You've got to be all in. You have to give things up. And again, these players are not machines. They are not robots. They are human beings. Some of them need that life experience aspect of the college as well, as well as developing mm -hmm. the tennis. Uh, and I don't know what headspace Fonseca is in. Is he playing freely because he's got these opportunities and he's an underdog and he knows he doesn't have to sustain a career for himself right away. That's just something else to put out there on the table. Um, for me, I'm convinced by how he's playing. I think the fact that he's been junior number one and a Grand Slam winner, that steers him more towards going pro straight away because he's shown that he can actually maintain a level with a target on his back. And to me, seems ready, but only he and his family can make that choice. So I'll just be very interested to see that. I was surprised when it was initially announced, for sure. Um, but you, yeah, you never know what other factors are at play. Yeah, that's good stuff. And uh, I, I think the the human developmental aspect of it is probably the most valuable thing about going to college. Uh, people like to make an argument about about the tennis, especially folks who are have a, a vested interest in bringing people to college tennis. But at the end of the day, I, I think the biggest thing is you're going to go live by yourself and look after yourself, develop socially and work with different coaches and all that. And I, I just think you learn how to be a human uh, versus instead of going right to the traveling circus, hotel to hotel. And uh, it's a very, very strange way to come of age, I think, on, on the tennis tour. Uh, we can get so before we get to questions, there's one more thing that it, it was commented about, but I didn't pull any of the real comments. I just want to bring it up. And it's kind of a follow up to uh, last week's mailbag as well. Actually, two weeks ago, it would be two weeks ago's mailbag about uh, the whole Garuna coaching situation. So he is reuniting with Patrick Maradoglu. And we can be quick on this. My take is, is very simple because when it comes to all of these things, there's a limit to what we even know. And that's why like, it's, it's fun to analyze coach player stuff, but it works way better in all the other sports. It works better in football and basketball where, where you can look at what they're doing schematically and are they taking advantage of anyway, it's just, it works better in tennis. It's tough. But what I will say is, yeah, of course there are questions here. If you separate it from Holger and Patrick, and even if you separate it from tennis and you and I, Abigail, we have a, a really good buddy uh, whose name is Alex. Like our friend Alex has been in this relationship 
and they've gotten together and broken up two times in the last seven or eight months, and now they're going for round three, back together for a third time. The conversation between us is not going to be like, yeah, I have full confidence. Like, no, nothing to, nothing to be worried about. I think the conversation between us about our friend Alex would be like, I don't know if this is right. So I, I'm there with, with Holger and Patrick. That's how it's going to be. Uh, they can, this can work out. This can be, they, they might have a, they might be together for the next, not to use relationship terminology, it might be the next five years and Holger's going to get to where he wants to get to and where Patrick wants to get Holger to. And it's a huge success. But right now, of course, there are going to be questions. That's just what the circumstance brings. Yeah, I agree. And I, I hope this works out for Runa because my viewpoint on it would be that he's a guy that's incredibly passionate, didn't quite pace himself the way he needed to last year and got very flustered when his results didn't match his expectations for himself. Uh, I'm not going to talk about, I guess, what's ad being added in terms of, I don't know, technically or any of that. Something that Muratoglu brings to him is a level of consistency and reassurance that he had when he was doing well. So it's that that has the potential to be the game changer for him. It's, you know, good memories, good history within that circle. And yeah, just just for him, I hope it settles because I I think probably flustered is a good word. It, it all just kind of started to get on top of him at the back end of last season and mentally and physically, he didn't have the the energy to combat that properly. So maybe this just settles him a little bit more and gives him a clearer headspace and focus going into the the what is majority left of the 2024 season. Yeah. All right, let's get into comment. Number one, to be honest with you, this is a, a comment that I, I feel like I've repetitively answered over the course of the last uh, couple of months. But since I have you on, I feel less bad about that redundancy. Uh, it comes from Tan May. Right now, Sinner seems to be unstoppable. What kind of play does a player need to dislodge him? Why isn't he great on clay? Okay, two very different questions there, but let's start with the first. Essentially, do you have any ideas about how you can beat Yannick Sinner right now? What needs to happen? Well, I think Daniil Medvedev showed us in the first two sets of the final at the Australian Open. He he brought a, a Sinner beaten game style that was not sustainable for him in the physical state that he was in. And ultimately, that's on Medvedev because he went down two sets to love twice in the lead up to that. And as much as you felt for him because he'd already lost in an Australian final from two sets to love up, yeah, he was just out of gas, but he, I mean, and it's a big ask, right? Because he kind of played flawless tennis for a while there, but it was big returns, big strikes, take time away within the first ball, first two balls and, and rock him back and, and don't give him time to set up for his forehand, which is such an improved shot from him over the last couple of years. Uh, the backhand always did talking. The forehand is now so much more purposeful it was so um i think it, it just felt so significant that he finished that match win with that forehand line winner because that's what he, he'd done so well to get back into that match and even to get into a winning position in the tournament uh but yeah i i think it's uh it's a big game that's relentlessly taken to him uh that might sound like a bit of a default answer because surely that's going to be enough against most players but Sinner's so well-rounded as an athlete, as a tennis player. You've got to catch him off guard like that. You've got to you've got to rob him of time, and yeah, just not not give him a half chance to set up to take the point on the way we know he can. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I can say here is it's a really hard question to answer, which is the biggest compliment to Yannick Sinner, and that is because it, it's very much like the how do you beat Djokovic question, and it's like. Is there a way to do that? Meaning you can win a match, but is there a particular style of opponent or a particular game plan that that we feel is a Djokovic beater? I, I would say no. I think there's too much well-roundedness for Novak. And now that Sinner has... I agree. I think the forehand is the biggest thing. Now that that forehand is more varied and more consistent and that he does bring net play into the equation. 
it's much harder to kind of, I think you used to be able to out solid him, absorb, 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 defend. He'd give you misses. And, and that's why Medvedev had an amazing head to head against him. Djokovic, amazing head to head. Uh, Zverev, I believe, uh, a positive head to head. Although I know Sinner beat him at Roland Garros when Zverev was sick uh, that one time. And that's just, let me drop back, absorb the power. He's going to miss. And that used to be a thing. That's not a thing anymore. His movement is also something that probably at some point it's if you make him run he's not that good going into the corners he's a little bit weaker in the legs than maybe he would want to be that's gone so this is just a really impossible question now which i would also say at some point will come into more clarity because you're asking us that question at a time when sinner basically hasn't lost in four months correct yeah i think yeah, sorry, Gil. I don't know if you were going to continue there, but um, yeah, he he's fully in the spotlight now, right? Yeah. So he's going to get analyzed more, and people are going to be active. Teams are going to be actively looking for those inroads and finding those ways to hurt him. But I think I, I prefer your answer to mine, to be honest. And that is is just a very difficult spot right now because of the kind of form he's riding and because of everything he's improved in recent history. So it's still pretty fresh. The potency of that forehand, for instance. It's not something that players have been working with for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, now, Demonor did out-consistent him. Like, on the forehand, Sinner's forehand, it had a, a pretty error-filled day. There was a comment in the mailbag uh, that I think w we can somewhat address right here, which is like, is can Demonor ever beat Yannick? Like, what needs to happen for, for, this, for Demon to finally get there? And I think he basically did everything in that Rotterdam match that you need to do to beat Sinner, which is... If you're not more solid than him, and if he doesn't miss some forehands for you, you're probably in trouble. But Demonor was the more solid player from the back of the court in that match. And ultimately, I think he was super close and just needed to capitalize on his short balls uh, a little bit better than he did in that match. And if he did, he, you know, I, I know he lost in straight sets, but both of those sets were were very close and, and right there for him. Want to go to the second part, the clay part? Is he that I, bad on clay? No, no, no. That that's what I was gonna say, Abigail. I, I don't know about this premise. Uh let me let me pull it up. So career records, and he's gone on this insane run on hardcore, which is gonna boost his numbers uh since the US Open last year. It's been only hardcore. So his win percentage on hard is 75.5%. His win percentage on clay is 67.2%. And his win percentage on grass after a really tough start to his career on grass is 60%. Uh, he has beaten Carlos Alcaraz on clay in Umag. He made the, he had some good wins and made the set. I guess the reason why this question might be asked is last year's clay court season was a little bit disappointing. Um, he had a, a withdrawal in, in Barcelona, but Sarundolo loss in Rome. Sarundolo, when he's at his best, is top. 15 borderline top 10 player on clay the Roland Garros loss was the only bad slam defeat that Sinner has taken really in the last three years and that was second round to Daniel Altmaier but I kind of reject the premise of Sinner being poor on clay and that match was a ridiculous level in the final set that's actually the match that really stayed with me from that tournament uh, he Altmaier played out of his skin to win that match. And that's where context comes into it. Because if you look at that on a surface level and the round and the player, that was the that was the match of Altmaier's life. He he I don't I don't think Sinner could believe the level that he sustained because there were chances for both re repetitively in the final set. And he, he just didn't let him have it. And it was working rallies. And yeah, look, Sinner's not going to win as many points as quickly on a clay court. But it, it was on clay where I first really took notice of him, to be honest. And I mm -hmm. remember thinking that he had good chances when he played Nadal at Roland Garros. And the, the awesome one that everyone was questioning Nadal on, was that have been end of 2020? Because the yes. conditions were different. And it was October. a cold night with no spectators, correct? And he did end up losing that in straights. But it, I think it was a tight first set. It was 7-5. Mm -hmm. And you could see... All the potential was there already. So, yeah, look, it's going to be a very testing clay season this time around because he's got such form going in other conditions. But then I threw caution to the wind where 
Australian Open was concerned because I said, look, he's built up the form he's currently riding largely on indoor hard courts at the end of last year. So how's he going to respond to best of five sets and coming outdoors? And he did respond. So it remains to be seen. But I guess that's the question in terms of can he transfer form to different conditions again? Yeah, well, we're we're alike thinkers then because I I am always someone who says pump the brakes when somebody goes on a run on the indoor hard courts after the U.S. Open. And uh, I'd say like 80% of the time, I look smart when I do that. And Sinner made me look dumb this time because- Same. Yeah. Same. Yeah. You know, it, it happens. Definitely. It's not going to, that philosophy, it's not going to work every time. I do think more often than not, you're going to come out on the right side of it if you take those- take the idea that you're just going to continue your your run of form from the end of the year on indoor hard courts to Australia. I think usually you'll end up on the right side of it, but uh, in the case of Sinner, definitely no. I feel bad to take up so long on this one thing before going to the next no, comment. I just, I just have one more thing. The Vanity Fair interview that Sinner just did, it was in Italian. It got translated. I first saw it on Twitter. I then went to the Vanity Fair fair article and put the translate to English. Some of those translations I think were rough. I will say that. But I got enough out of it to see, wow, this is a guy who is so incredibly focused on the tennis and really doesn't care about any of the other stuff. Like he said on the flight home, he was thinking about, he was being hard on himself about going down two sets to love and thinking about what he needed to improve. He said he didn't have a sip of alcohol. Like every quote in that interview was like, you, you really don't care about any of this other stuff. You are a deadly, deadly person when it comes to getting better at tennis. Yeah, love that. So much time for that. If he can, if he can keep that going. And I think he can. I think he's got the personality to Sinner. He seems like a very level human being. Mm -hmm. Um and has definitely had that as a foundation point. So yeah, that that's funny. I've not actually seen that myself, but uh, to imagining him on one that more. flight, thinking I, about the first two sets, brilliant. Unreal, brilliant. right? I have one yeah. more, one more that he said. He said he often gets the cheaper pasta out at restaurants. I uh, heard that one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and it's, it's, he says, cause it's, I respect money, not because I'm, you know, not because it's like I can't spend it or I don't want to spend any money, but he just like he's still that kind of thing. I don't know. It's just an interesting window in, into his personality. And uh, it it goes to show, look, it's hard to not have a hangover after winning a major like that. When you read that interview and then you look at, OK, he had no hangover. He just won Rotterdam. It starts to make sense. Let's go to the next one. Uh, it comes from G. Bon the Great. Hey, Gil, tell us about Andy Murray. After a promising first six months of 2023, it has spiraled downhill. Why? Today, he won his first match of the season playing aggressive tennis. Do you see him turning it around, or is this the beginning of the end? Uh, adding context to that, obviously, he'd lose his next match against Jakob Mensik, three tie-break sets. Abigail, where do you stand on the, the Murray slump? Something that, surprisingly, I haven't covered all that much on the channel. Yeah. Um... <sighs> Is is really tough because Andy Murray is as competitive as they come. That's why he's still here. He's not been at a level he would want to be at. Well, since coming back from the surgery all those years ago, what it, it I think it'll be five years at the end of this year since he won that title the, the season that he came back when he beat Vavrinka in the final. I mm -hmm. think I've got that right. I think it was 2019. Um, the difficulty with Murray, everybody knows about the hip surgery, the brand of tennis that got him to be one of the all time greats of the game that he is, is not playable for him across matches anymore. He doesn't have the physicality for that. It's tough to reinvent yourself as a player, even in your teens or twenties. Give that task to a guy in his 30s who has had the experience of being world number one, Grand Slam champion, all of this stuff, who has such a fiery competitive nature that it's always going to be hard for him to accept that he had a level that he doesn't have anymore. Yeah, he, he's done well at times to bring a more aggressive game style to matches. 
it's going to take a lot, a lot, a lot from him to be that, to be sustainable with that within matches from start to finish, let alone match after match after match. So for him, and look, I know he hates people talking about this because at the end of the day, it's Andy Murray's life and it's Andy Murray's career and he can do it as long as he wants to do it. There is, there's no question. Um, but I felt coming into this season that it was about finding an appropriate point to finish that he would be happy with. I think his big flourish and something that nothing, no one can take away from him is the fact he won that title after coming back. I remember having a fierce exchange with someone. It was at one of the ATP challenges that we thought had been set up for Murray for a comeback in 2018. We had a couple, we had one in Loughborough and one in Glasgow in, in the UK and Murray was not ready, didn't end up playing them. And there was just this older guy on the doors. And uh, um, I, I said, at whatever level, Murray would be back. This guy actually, like, he raised his voice and he shouted me down and he said, no, Murray is done. He will never be on a court again. I was like, wow, like, wh why do you care that much you know, <laughs> to that level? But also I was surprised that he was so adamant but just because of Murray's pure competitive fire. I thought in whatever state he would be in, he'd be back on court. The fact he came back and won a trophy, for me, he's done enough there. For him, from there, maybe it's enjoyment and for someone who's, had results before and knows they have a level in them should their body allow it there's always that temptation to go on and chase it and then you get lost in this wilderness and you suddenly because that high point is behind you you don't know where to stop he's struggling now for a finishing point i think um and also as the competitor he is it just makes it even harder but that's where i stand on it i think that look there that that level of world number one and grand slam champion is it's never coming back yeah and reinvention is very very hard that that's my outlook yeah uh, i completely agree about the the adaptation of styles and he he came back from the surgery that was always going to be the problem is can andy murray play a completely different brand of tennis that that would be required of him in his post hip surgery physical state which at times has been a decent physical state. It's just yeah. what he requires is a superhuman physical state. He was a he was one of the best athletes I've ever seen on a court when it comes to if you're just taking the movement and endurance side of it. He was one of the best athletes, I think, in the history of the game. Uh, and I don't think that should be a bold statement. Um, now, I do think there's another layer of problem now because he's playing even below the level – that or he has played below the level that we've seen him capable of post hip surgery and i don't think that's been physical necessarily i think it's been mental uh the the scar tissue has seemingly built up from uh you know the the slump that he's been on and for some and maybe it's because the standards have always been so high for him that he struggled to almost absorb the body blows of taking first round losses or you know, uh, losing sets to lower ranked opponents, whatever it is, he has clearly been in his head over the course of this slump. And like, you just think, take something like the easy volley he missed in the first set against Mensik. I can just imagine, and I don't need to imagine it. This is, this is the other thing with Murray. He verbalizes his inner dialogue. Like he says it out loud. And I think people were reading his lips and he said, this game isn't for me anymore at one point in, in the Mensik match. And, and people have kind of made a big, the aggregators have published that. It's made a little bit of noise online. Here's the thing, Abigail, like we, we both agree. Players say that to themselves all the time on the court. Yeah, always. And right? they and they will see, say things in the heat of the moment that they do not mean probably in every other match that they play. Yeah every other match that they play it's a it's a very very consistent thing you just don't always have access to those sound bites. Yeah, yeah usually it's not an out loud thing i want to end on this my observation has been he plays better at love all than he does at 30 all right now there is a you can see the dip in level when it's in a return game first point of the game versus it's 30 all and he has an opportunity to break mentally there's there are problems right now definitely and that when it, the mental thing is that deep 
it takes time to untangle and he's short on time right now, which probably adds to that problem. I think the bottom line for me would be, look, Maria Sharapova is a very different story, but she started losing all the kinds of matches that she would always win. And that was when it was the end of the road for her. She she retired, she ended it. Maria is currently losing all the kinds of matches that he would always win. He specialized in eking out, grinding out the kinds of matches that are the ones that he's routinely losing right now. And that's a very good point you make about the difference between love all and 30 all, because it's that tight end that he used to dominate that's now getting to him. And heck, we could even throw that to Serena Williams. She was a beast at the back end of majors. In the last few seasons of her career, that was where she struggled. Mm -hmm. Her hunting grounds... And ultimately, she accepted that. She knew there had to be an end point, but it took some time. It took slam semifinal losses, which basically never happened to her. And it took several slam final losses before she admitted that that had to be it. And she never got out, actually, of that mental funk. And that's the greatest player of all time. Yeah. So I, I think it is actually no shame if, if Murray Khan actually turn this one around but yeah I, th I think it's mentally gone very deep at this point yeah man by the way everybody has been saying including andy himself he's been crushing it in practice the level has been there in practice darren cahill said he beat yannick center in practice before the australian open and that also adds to the argument that uh there's mental stuff okay uh next one is from ma i love this comment i love it a lot has tennis become more of a percentage game than ever Looking at Djokovic's success for years and now Sinner's game style, it looks like they are both playing the right shot at the right time almost always. I am a long-term Djokovic fan, so even as one, I can say that. Looking at his and Sinner's game style, it seems that the robotic approach to tennis is the future. Even Medvedev and Murray before are doing the same thing. Also, one-handed backhands leaving the top 10 seems to be exactly because of that, because it is less percentage than playing with two hands. What are your thoughts? I want to give you the first much word short, on this. Yeah, much shorter than the other ones, actually. I, I'd say yes, like 100%. And it's interesting because I was commentating ATP Delroy Beach last week. I always make a, a point of listening to a few uh, podcasts Shout out to Behind the Racket Pod with um, Mike Cation and Noah Rubin. That they're, they're really good with Absolutely. that. And I, I was, yeah, I was listening to one of theirs, um, and I think it was Alexander Kovacevic. I might have that wrong, but he was, was it him or was it? Could have been another of the Americans. But anyway, he was talking about whoever it was was talking about playing Djokovic. Um, I'm, I'm overthinking now. It could have been Zachary Spider. I don't know. But they were talking okay. about playing Djokovic and these guys in practice. And their very first comment was, you realize when you actually hit with them that it's all about percentages. You watch them on TV and you think they're winning in a certain way. And then you hit with them and they're just putting every ball back in the court with margin over and over and over and over again and know exactly when to switch things up. And I think I think there's another question you've got relating to speeds of the court, balls that are being used. I think with with the way the courts have slowed down, that's played more into this becoming a percentages game because it's harder to win those points than it would have been ten years ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I yeah I would say that more and more it has become a percentage game for sure. We started the show by talking about Fonseca and Mensik. And I'm pretty sure in both cases, I brought up some sort of Yannick Sinner, Novak Djokovic similarity. So yeah, I am, I am seeing this. Now, I don't think it's necessarily about playing safe, um, but I think there is, I like the word robotic. I think the, the whole robotic thing sometimes comes from a, a completeness not having as many flaws and that can translate oh and making sound and percentage decisions every time those things can translate to sort of a roboticism i think i just made up a word but i'm i'm also seeing that where it's like the forehand is machine like the back end is machine like you can move into both corners and you try to make percentage decisions now i do think is there a lot of power in the game Increasingly, 
there's a ton of power in, in the game because you can also look at Fonseca and Mensik and Sinner and even Alcaraz, who doesn't really fit into the robotic mold, but it's okay. Well, we're, we're hitting harder now. Um, the, the serves are getting bigger. Yeah, I, I think this trend is is a real thing. I think a lot of players are starting to resemble Novak Djokovic with power. Yeah, I, and to to be clear, Djokovic is also a, a powerful player. I've spoken to multiple people that have hit with Djokovic, and they say you do not appreciate how low and fast he can hit the ball until you've actually stood opposite it. It's very deceptive, actually, because and I think part of that is the repetition and kind of the mono pace that he's able to maintain. I mean, don't get me wrong; he's not going to blitz you off the court necessarily, if, unless he wants to. But yeah, I, I think Djokovic carries a level of power that is probably underappreciated, just in terms of his ground stroke level. Oh, it a hundred percent is underappreciated. He, I would say, the difference is, I think, coming up certainly the power wouldn't be one of the first parts of the conversation with Novak, like I think it's been with Sinner. First thing was power, Mensik and Fonseca. It's really high on the list, you know, as, as one of the first things you're going to talk about is how big they can hit the ball off the ground. Uh, but especially now for Novak, yeah, I think I think he's hitting a lot bigger than people realize. And part of that is because of uh, just how repeatable and within himself he looks when he's doing it. All right. Um, this is another one about styles, and I like these kinds of questions, and they're kind of typical on the mailbags. Uh, from Sloppy Gamer, the recent loss of one-handed backhands in the top 10 for the first time has me thinking about the serve and volley players from the past. Do you think it's still feasible for a serve and volley player to still reach the top echelons of the sport, or is it too difficult nowadays considering court speeds, return strength, etc i think they've almost answered their own question there to be honest with you I, and it's a good question um i don't know if your opinion on this would would differ to me gil but i i think that i mean it's courts have slowed down excruciatingly since the 2000s i think if you ask any player who played at that time and has maybe sustained a career might just be playing doubles now uh they, they would offer you that insight uh, and the thing is, with with court speeds now, you're you're struggling if you you actually play the serve and volley too many points in a row. You've got to sprinkle that in strategically mm -hmm. because players are becoming so good at the back of the court. There's a lot of time spent at the baseline. You look at your top players, Novak Djokovic, still at world number one. He loves the target, so you are not going to beat him just by serve and volleying all match. That gives them a different kind of rhythm. There's a different kind of rhythm of knowing the player is consistently going to come to the front of the court. The last time I remember seeing it done really, really successfully, like point after point, was, I don't know, maybe Dustin Brown against Rafa Nadal at Wimbledon, or I, I think Sergei Stokowski did it really well against Federer. Um, but again, that's a grass court. It's, it's a faster surface. And I, I just think if you are, by default, by natural tendency, a serve and volley player it probably means that you're not as strong at the back of the court. And to be a really top player these days, you have to be versatile. You can't just rely on one thing, whether that is grinding at the back or whether that is coming straight up to the forecourt. And a, a lot of the serve and volley players, they play to the conditions. They play to the surface. Conditions are not the same now. So I, I love to see a serve and volley every now and then. I think it is underused as a strategy. But also I think there's probably a reason for that in terms of, what is being used right now you cannot serve and volley on return games it's never been done some say it's impossible so yeah it's like the the thing is with cressy i love what you said about the back of the court he's he holds serve at a phenomenal rate like serve and volley works just look at how well he holds and he's serving volleying all the time but can you what what are the drawbacks in terms of developmentally? Can you actually play like that and have a good ground game? Will we ever see that? Probably not. Look, I think we've reached a point on tour of the serve and volley, as far as I'm concerned, has made a comeback. It's here where Daniil Medvedev has had to make an adjustment in his return position, has had to work in the offseason on 
taking the return earlier because he has lost so many matches against top players where who have had the rare ability to do it to take advantage of that. And I'm talking about a Nick Kyrgios or a Novak Djokovic or a Carlos Alcaraz. They're serving volleying because of the deep return position. So it can still, it's being used as a tactic again, rightly so. But we're not going to see, I don't think, ever again, the I do this every point. And court speed, I agree. But also the RPM that is being generated from all contact points, crucially, including low contact points, uh, makes it way too easy to give players low volleys now. And I think that's a, a huge deal. Just the string technology is if if you're on balance, all these players are able to make uh, net approachers hit a volley from their shoelace, and that puts them at a massive disadvantage. So I think topspin um, is also part of the conversation along with court speed. Let's go to uh, let's go to the next one. It is about Lorenzo Musetti. From Sean, hi Gil, recently it seems Musetti has faced a series of tough losses, especially with the brutal beatdown loss against Zhang in Doha. With all the hype surrounding Lorenzo Musetti in 2023 after beating Djokovic in Monte Carlo last year, what would you say has been hindering him to live up to the expectations some placed on him to be a part of the new younger generation of title winners? Want me to start on this one? Do you want to start on this one? You've been very kind letting me go first every sure. time. So if yeah, I'll, I'll go up. first on this one. Why not? So first of all, I think there's some stuff about mental and, and clutchness and the, the fragility of, of his belief and his confidence. But I can kind of go past that because I don't know that, that I have much more to say about it. If you look at how he's made up as a player, I must admit, I think as far as a top 10 level goes consistently. Uh, to me right now, as he's currently constructed, he's fighting an uphill battle. And it goes back to somewhat of the one-handed backhand conversation and how difficult it is to return serve as a one-handed backhand. But I'm not saying that Musetti doesn't return well enough to be a top 10 player with his one-handed backhand. It's quite the contrary. It's that I compare him to Tsitsipas, who has had a ton of success as a top 10 player. And what Stefanos has is a, a first serve and a forehand that is absolutely killer. You'd put it up with anybody. Musetti is the opposite. He's a, he's a player who's going to need to rely on breaking serve a lot with a one-handed backhand, winning baseline rallies a lot with a one-handed backhand because he doesn't have the first serve and the forehand that, that Tsitsipas has. So... In the top 50, Musetti ranks 46th in ace rate and 41st in first serve win percentage. He is a one-handed backhand who needs to break serve all the time. That's tough. It is tough. I, I think they're all really good points. The other thing that I would say is, I mean, the question pointed out the win against Djokovic in Monte Carlo. Take surface into account. He's got more time to set for his backhand on a clay court. And that can make it look like a really lethal weapon. But I called his match against Jack Draper uh, in Sofia. I think that was indoor hard courts. He was consistently rushed for time on that one-handed backhand. And I don't think it's a coincidence if you think Sitsipas has had you know, some of his strongest results on clay reaching the Roland Garros final. Dominic Team, that was you know, multiple Grand Slam uh, Roland Garros finals for him, multiple wins over Novak Djokovic there, but Rinka winning Roland Garros, like these one-handed backhands, they have more time to get set on clay, even if that is jumping up more to their backhand. And, and Mazzetti has the ability to be a consistent presence at the back of the court. I think that really plays into it. Uh, there's no coincidence that that biggest win of his career to date has come on that surface. Mazzetti was amazing on clay last year. L let's yeah. see how he defends all these points, but he had a phenomenal clay court season. The problem has been there's been really... I mean, he hasn't had, I don't know, top 75 results off clay. I think that would be accurate um, in terms of his, his win rate and the points he's accumulated and such off clay. But uh, let's see what happens there. We're going to do two more. This next one is a big one. It's a super long comment, but uh, I do think it is a really interesting one. It also got a lot of likes, uh, which frankly surprised me. So people are interested in this. It comes from... Aladdin. 
Hey, Gil, do you think there should be punishment for Rublev's on-court self-harm, such as when players smash rackets? And do you think it needs to be treated as a more serious issue? It sets a bad example of tennis, especially when kids are watching, and is simply distressing to watch, taking away from the enjoyability of the matches. It also often disrupts the game, leading Rublev to take medical timeouts if he starts bleeding and has unfortunately become a frequent feature of Rublev's matches, already doing it multiple times this year, most recently last week in Rotterdam. On the other hand, it seems that Rublev will simply continue with this type of behavior regardless of punishment, as he seems self-aware when he's asked about it. He calls it, quote, disgusting, but admits he does it when he loses control saying that it comes from a place of resentment for himself. He also has broken his own wrist after a match by repeatedly opening and closing the door until his wrist broke, leading him to missing a few months of tennis. This issue seems bigger than the online tennis community acknowledges. No other player really demonstrates any behavior that is remotely similar, and it could be mentioned more delicately, not just as Rublev going, quote, crazy. It's quite a big mental struggle for him, and sometimes I wonder if this isn't taken as seriously as it should, both in the punishment, but also being more sensitive and joking about it less when talking about Rublev's on-court antics. What do you think the response to this behavior should be, if any? I want to jump in first and say I have not thought as deeply about this as this commenter has. I will admit it. Um, and and I'm not saying I'm I'm right about that. I, I'm actually probably wrong to have not thought more deeply about this. But I have not. My relationship with this topic has been concern that Andre Rublev is going to sabotage himself in a big match. I have always thought th there are some things and some habits that he falls into that I believe put himself at risk of injury. And my worst nightmare for him is that he is going to, again, sabotage his ability to play a match because he hurts himself. That is kind of, that, that's what I've thought about, but maybe there are some larger things and, and that's not going deep enough when it comes to considering this as an issue. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a definite fair aspect of it. Um, I, you know, as a commentator, I think people over the years have defaulted too much in terms of, I'm sure his fans get annoyed by, because he does have this very obvious emotional presence uh, and commentators will jump on that. And they'll sometimes they'll uh, accuse it as a reason for loss when, you know, that's just how he is. The fact that that is just how he is as a concern for him. I'm not concerned about him. I'm concerned for him. Um, very much over the definitely the past few years look i see these tennis players as human beings just the circles that i'm in like a lot of my closest friends now are tennis players and i think it reached a point with rublev at the back end of last season where i saw a couple of things happened and i i wondered if he was okay you know um and i was i was kind of concerned that he played through the off season he was playing these exhibitions he didn't seem to take a lot of a break but from my perspective and I wonder if that's kind of keeping his mind busy maybe he doesn't have to I don't want to go too deep but this comes from a place of concern mm -hmm. for him I I wonder players over recent years have have taken time out not for injuries for other things because they think they need time they think they need space I wonder if he needs to take a bit of time for himself because he is so hard on himself and he's so passionate about the tennis that that can affect him in troubling distressing ways and for me i'd said to someone at the back end of last season i wonder if andre needs to take a break if he needs to kind of address some things um because we don't know the, these players we don't know what's going on behind the scenes and rublev's opened the door a little bit and he has actually shed some light on some of what he deals with in his head um but yeah i just it's out of people's hands a little bit. Look, he will get penalized yeah. for smashing a racket. He he will have these fines imposed on him the same way other players will. He's not exempt to that. But if this is to actually change, that has to come from him. That's not actually going to come from anyone else. And he has to to want to do those things to to address that. So, I mean, I just just wish the best for him and and that he and the people around him know how to to proceed with that because that's got to come from him. Yeah, that's super well said. I totally agree. I don't think that there's a uh, an adjustment that can be made in the code of conduct necessarily to try to uh, 
penalize Rublev more heavily for for this kind of thing. I mean, yes, it is a little bit it's a little bit strange the way it works where it's like, did your racket break? Because if your racket didn't break, it's not a code violation, right? Like you can smash your racket against your knee until your knee starts bleeding and you don't get racket abuse. And there's no penalty in the book called knee abuse. Maybe there should be. But at the same time, I don't think that that's the answer. I don't think it's, we need to look to a rule change to, to get Andre uh, to, to maybe get better at, at taking care of, of himself and controlling the, the, uh, the concerning elements of some of his negative outbursts. Um, yeah, I, it does need to come from him and, and his team. I, I would agree with that. Can I add one more thing? Yeah. It's just kind of vaguely related, but it's something I felt strongly on for a few years. The, the media and social media and everything needs to stop promoting mental issues as entertainment. They did it constantly with Nick Kyrgios, and we've had a break from that because he's mm. he's been away from the game. But I was never comfortable with that. There was good tennis and, and other things going on, and you you turn on, you load up Instagram, and there's like a, a, a highlights reel of Kyrgios melting down. That's not funny. That's a problem. That's a problem for him. That's a problem for... Yeah, I just I just feel really strongly on it, and I think there's been danger of almost leaning that way with Rublev as well. These are, are serious people, and they have every every one of us is dealing with something, and uh, the the way that outbursts and the like have been branded as entertainment, and this is how we're going to promote our sport. That will never sit well with me ever. Wow. Yeah. That that's a that's a great point. I think morally, y- you are absolutely spot on. But as is the case with so many issues in our society, you are pinning morality against a certain level of, I don't want to say capitalism, but uh, essentially in, in the case of this, the, 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 the capitalism of the internet is attention and engagement, and this stuff gets that attention and engagement. So uh, those things battle against each other, and it would actually take some moral clarity in that area. Uh, at the expense of maybe the things that these anybody running a social media account actually wants, uh, it would take that sacrifice and that that judgment and that uh, prioritization in order to get to that place. All right, one more, uh, but I want to give you a choice. There are some obviously, as always with the mailbag, there's some really great comments that we couldn't get to. Uh, would you like to talk about the Botic code violation, excessive grunting? Casper Ruud's scheduling, wild cards, or doubles withdrawals? Oh. This is so I, tough. I almost feel bad for making you make this decision. But How many I feel, please no one be offended because I think all these are good questions. But are you saying one or two more? I, I was saying one more just because what? It's been about an sure. hour. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, look, I called the Van Der uh, Monfils match, so I guess I have thoughts on that. But also, I, I've I've had thoughts on the doubles thing for a long time. Oh, really? Time. And okay. I, yeah, and I think that's a really interesting discussion point. What are you feeling? Okay, so I won't weigh in on the Botic thing. Give me give me your quick take, and then we'll go to the doubles. I just think it links a little bit to what I was saying in terms of the human element of players and them not being robots. In terms of a statistical point of thing, there was no real logic for what happened to Van der Zanschelt because he started drooping the shoulders and getting mad and getting frustrated with the situation when like, he had set point and Monfils played a high level of tennis to win that point. And he did it a couple of times. And before Van der Zanschelt actually had opportunity and didn't capitalize on it. He was already in his own head. He was already mad. He won the point where he launched the ball into the crowd. I mean, on on a statistical tennis front, that doesn't make sense. He was low on match confidence compared to Monfils, I think. So there's that aspect, and you just never know what's happening in the head, in the life off court. You know, if you're secure off the court, generally you're pretty secure on the court it works that way so i don't want to speculate but i just think there's in those kinds of situations it was very strange and there's often more than meets the eye it might just have been a lack of confidence and i know he is a guy that can get down on himself a little bit but that was extremes so yeah that's just my brief take on that yeah i mean from an on-court perspective i don't know that he's been the same since the 5-2 lead against runa in the final at munich he went on a massive losing streak after that and 
I, I know I said it very cautiously, but honestly, I'm, I'm pretty adamant about it. He hasn't been the same since that match, unfortunately. Uh, it seems like uh, something that, that has really lingered for him, but it, it has been a while, so maybe maybe it's wrong to go back that far and say this is still an issue, but that that's what it has seemed to me. Um, okay, let's go to this doubles withdrawal question from Adrian. Um, and nice that we're getting to this one because apparently he's asked it two times before this. Okay, not sure if you've already given your thoughts on this before, but what are your thoughts on high-profile singles players at tournaments entering doubles at the same tournament only to pull out when, one, they progress further than expected in the singles and need to conserve energy, or two, lose in the singles and lose the drive to stay at the tournament any longer. I saw that the doubles teams of Marta Kostyuk, Jess Pagula, Nuno Borges, and Adrian Manorino suddenly pull out of the doubles throughout the Australian Open. While I kind of understand why they do this, I think it hurts both their partners and the doubles tournaments as a whole. In these instances, I kind of wish the singles players in question didn't enter the doubles at all. Your thoughts? Is there something I'm missing? You first. Yes. So um, in recent times, the Grand Slams have allowed singles players to use their singles rankings to get into the doubles tournament. Um, this has resulted in a lot of withdrawals because the singles player's priority are their singles matches. And, and if their run there extends, the odds that they stick around in doubles dwindles. You also have the situation of early losses for, for big name players, big R name players who, who've chosen to enter doubles. Uh, I've seen this so many times in action. It's actually a, a conversation I've had multiple times over the past year. This, this system was put in place because tournament organizers want more interest in the doubles they think big names will bring that attention. Now, why why are those players entering in the first place? It's not just from a tennis point of view. It's big money at the slams. It is big money at the slams, even for like a, a first first round loss, first round win. Um, it, it's significant compared to what you're running at, at other tournaments in early rounds. Uh, then, I mean, there's all different aspects of this. You've got players in relationships. If they lose in singles, they keep going in doubles, more time at the tournament, maybe with their significant other. There's all these all these kinds of things that factor into it. I think it hurts doubles more than it helps it because you do have these inconsistencies. You have these random partnerships. You have um, a non-sustainability. I see where they're coming from in terms of allowing it and wanting that star power, but I don't think it's going to make the world of difference in terms of, I don't want to name names, okay? But US Open... There was a player ranked, I don't know, 50, 60 something at the time, maybe higher, uh, entered the doubles, was having a decent singles run. Two players from that player's nation were ranked top 100 in doubles, on site, second alternate, had gone purely for doubles, had traveled to the States, all in for it, didn't get to play. You know, this player walked on court, played doubles, was not playing doubles to as high a level as the singles, lost in straight sets. That player's name was not going to do much at all, if anything, to change who was going to attend that match. So I think there's a shout for it if you say maybe the top 10 singles players can use their singles rankings to get into the doubles tournament because that's not taking up so many places. And that star power is actually having an impact on attendance and who's interested in watching the match. I think the further down you go, the less it really impacts and more of those players are playing both disciplines anyway. So I think that needs to be addressed. I get that I get the point of why they've allowed that to be the case. And I completely get why any player who's given the opportunity would want to play those matches because who does not want to be at a Grand Slam longer? Who does not want the extra practice? Who doesn't want the prize money? If that's at their disposal, they will use it. But I don't think they should be in the position where they're able to outside of a certain ranking. I would agree with you. And I hadn't put as much thought into this as as you. So um I'm glad. I know a few double specialists who've been affected by this, so yeah, it's been a who, talking who, and, point. And they look at it, so they look at it, and they how they're they're rubbed the wrong way by it. Oh well, yeah. Well, some of them are not getting in because singles yeah. players are getting in their spots using their singles ranking and then pulling out first round or second rounds, or you know playing for the money and losing early. And they, I think these players can understand why they would do that, but the argument is why should they be given that opportunity? when it's not a discipline they're actively training for. Yeah, love it. 
All right. Uh, we're gonna end. Uh, we're gonna end on that. Uh, no, no Radu Kanu question. Is this? this it's rare. Rare oh, you go God. a podcast. No Radu Kanu. Uh, but I actually want to say there was a comment about it. Personally, I have nothing interesting or original to say about her right now, so that factored in. But also, I just want you to tell the the audience because you've told me, and I just think they'll appreciate it and it's interesting. At this moment in time, why do you not love talking about Emma Raducanu on podcasts? Did you know that I actually did on the Tennis Channel Inside In one? I did. I know. That was I a knew bit that. deeper. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Um, well, that, that's another thing. Also, I don't want to step on Mitch. Mitch's toes. Mitch did a great podcast sure. with you this week. Uh, so if you are interested in Abigail's Emma Raducanu take, check out the Tennis Channel Inside In podcast. No, but but I'm I'm happy to repeat um yeah i can i can give you the full of it there are way too many opinions on emma raducanu there is too much noise everyone thinks they're an expert everyone wants to give her this bit of advice everyone thinks they're going to change her life none of us are it's not relevant it's too much and look i was one of the people that had a good look at her coming through I actively stepped away after she won the US Open because there were just too many people who wanted to be involved at that point and too many people with voices. It's not fair on her. And that suffocating pressure in the aftermath of the US Open has factored because there was there was not a respect for the situation that she came through, youthful, fresh to the scene, had developed behind closed doors, drawer opened up, she was allowed to skip a lot of rungs of the ladder, there was not a good wealth of knowledge, tennis knowledge, where she sat within the scene in the aftermath of that run. Expectations way too heightened. Um, I'm I'm not sure if this is fully. I can't really remember your initial initial question. Oh, Gil, I actually, but... Abigail, I asked you why you don't like talking about Emirato Kano because I thought yeah. I well, you basically did just say it, obviously. So so you did answer it, but that's all I asked. What did I say to you the other day? You said that there are way too many opinions constantly oh, swirling around. Yeah, there I mean, you go. and, and yeah, look, too it, many. It's true. Whenever you say anything about about Emma, because she she again, it goes back to what does good numbers and traffic on the internet. She does good traffic. Exactly. So anybody who thinks anything, regardless of if it's interesting or uh, even appropriate at the time or, or tasteful or, or whatever, it, it goes everywhere. Um, yeah. So like, like right now, I, again, as I said, I got nothing interesting. Now, could I like, if I wanted attention, could I easily get it by just figuring out something to say? Of course I could. Uh, but obviously that's not how we roll here. No. And actually, I think the conversation that we had stemmed from what I was saying about a podcast I'd done at the beginning of the year. And I said maybe one or two lines on Radicanu actively tried to avoid her. And then when that was promoted by another source, the Radicanu lines were what was pulled out. And I was quite happy with what I put out there. I'm very careful with what I say about her. Yeah. But it's what you say. It, it's like, like I was saying in terms of the social media and promoting outbursts that cross the line. People know what drives traffic. People know what pulls in eyeballs and turns heads. And I feel for her because that's creating a very negative narrative around her because there is this pile on and it just snowballs and, and spirals. And for anyone, that's very tough to take. So I would just rather not add to that. Yep. Uh, this was such an amazing conversation. And you did an incredible job this week on T2. I, I believe it will be the first of many trips to LA for you. And uh, I certainly hope that's the case. Yeah, me too. It's It's been a pleasure. I, I just want to say to everyone watching, you know how great Gil is. Um, I had to try and live up to his standards today. I had to try and do that this week. He works so hard, puts in the effort, knows his stuff, knows his stats. And uh, that's challenging to me to keep my level up and uh, yeah, follow in your footsteps. So uh, thank, thanks for showing me how it's done this week. You helped me settle into the whole T2 thing and a great team here of producers and everything as well. And yeah, it would make me very happy to come back and do some more. And always a pleasure to come on your channel as well. 
Uh, it's been great to watch it grow over the years. I need to actually watch it more, to be honest with you. I'm very bad with keeping up on the YouTube and podcast scene. Um, but yeah, me thank too. you. Really me, appreciate it. Yeah, me, me too. I do not watch a lot of or listen to a lot of uh, tennis podcasts because I spend enough time watching tennis and doing my own. Uh, your checks in the mail for everything you just said. And uh, do know I, I take a lot from you as well. So uh, that is that is mutual. Thanks for oh, coming thanks, on. Thanks, Gil. Yeah, no, thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.